spearfishing has or will strike your business, wreaking havoc on your employees, brand, and your bottom line. Spearfishing can't be stopped by traditional email security solutions because messages appear to be legitimate from your boss, a trusted colleague, or a vendor asking you to wire money, confirm login credentials, or worse. Barracuda Sentinel is artificial intelligence for real-time spear phishing and cyber fraud defense. Reclaim your email in minutes with zero impact on network performance. Visit barracuda.com slash AI. That's right. It is the Dan Lebitard Show with Stu Gatz on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, and Sirius XM Channel 80. No Dan, no Stu, no shipping container. Sarah Spain and Jason Fitz in for the guys. You can regularly hear Spain and Fitz weeknights 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern. But we're in for the guys today since it's a holiday. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. You can always shoot us a message on the 1-800-Flowers Twitter feed, at ESPN Radio, at Sarah Spain, at Jason Fitz. Probably a lot of messages, Fitz, today about how we're too much sports, where Stu and Dan, mm-hmm. this ruined their day. So let's just get those out of the way. This is the best thing for me, you know, every time I'm on a new show, it means that I just need to get off Twitter for like three days afterwards. <laughs> right. because Who's this le- guy? Yeah, the world gets to remind me how much they think I suck for about 24 hours. It's great. It's, 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 it's right. good. It's good. Right. Well, this should be an interesting endeavor because as usual, I'm in Chicago, but instead of you being in Bristol, you're in Nashville. Our producer's out, our other producer's in Bristol, and Mikey C's here. So add it all together, and uh, this should be an adventure. Party. An adventure. Uh, the good news is we have a ton to talk about because contrary to what you suggested last week when we were heading into this weekend of football, we had an insane weekend of football. And for those of you who don't usually listen to us, um, I would say that, I would say that we're best known for being NFL experts. Um, and if you take a listen, I'm sure you'll understand why. You've heard all week it's the best weekend in the NFL. And it's not true. Foles under his center. Gives it off. Blunt. Going out front. He's in. Touchdown. We've got a one seed in the NFC in the Eagles that's without their starting quarterback and I think is going to get thumped. Ryan rolls. Ryan comes. Ryan is throwing it up in the air. Incomplete. Incomplete. And the Eagles take over on down with 58 seconds left. I'm going Falcons big in this game. And it's over. It's over. The clock takes away the final seconds, and the Eagles have defeated the Atlanta Falcons 15 to 10. They are one win away from the Super Bowl. This Steelers team, when they are focused, when they put things together, and they take advantage of the weapons that they have on offense, I absolutely think they're going to win this game. The give to Fournette running right up the middle of the field toward the goal line. Touchdown! A three-yard touchdown run by Leonard Fournette has extended the lead at Heinz Field. I think that the mental aspect of this game will come in, and that means playoff experience, and that means the aura and vibe that you're getting coming across the field at you from a very, very established Steelers team. Jacksonville picks it up, takes two steps, Keelan Cole takes a knee, and Jacksonville has defeated the Pittsburgh Steelers. Jacksonville is headed to the American Football Conference Championship game. I think the Saints win this football game, but this is the one I'm the most excited for. Snap good, spot down, four bath with plenty of leg, and it is good! Ty Forbath, yes! I trust Drew Brees more than I trust Case Keenum, and that's all this comes down to. Lutz steps into it, and it's good! From 43 yards out and 25 seconds left, the Saints retake the lead. I don't think the Vikings are going to be able to score a lot of points. I don't love Case Keenum, obviously. Like I think none of us believe in Case Keenum. Let's say it that way. Case on a deep throw. Steps up in the pocket. He'll fire to the right side. Caught by Diggs. Stay alive. I think none of us believe in Case Kim. Right, so about that. Hey, 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 at least the good news is there were no Titans clips in there. We were both right on the Titans. What do you know? Wow, we really went out on a limb, too, by choosing the (laughs) Patriots over the Titans. 
Uh, but you were right. Sarah Spain, Jason Fitz in for the guys. We, uh, we didn't get everything right. But I will say the funniest part to me was that you backed yourself into a corner with that Jags pick because you and your old co-host, Jordan Rogers, were chatting. You decided your hot take was going to be not only will the Jaguars be pretty good this season, but they're going to win more than one playoff game. And after saying that, you decided to be a man of your word, which is not something that this show is usually associated with. And you stuck with it. And I, by laughing your way through predicting a Jaguars win, you actually were right. The funny thing is, I haven't heard from Jordan. I mean, Jordan spent all this time railing every week about how bad the Jags are. And, you know, maybe I went a little hot takey, but I specifically told him they would go into Pittsburgh and win when we talked about it. And I haven't heard from him since. I mean, it's better to be lucky than good, Sarah. I always say that. Better to be lucky than good. I was lucky on that one. Uh, but I'll take it, you know, Jordan, if you want to, you know, hit a guy up every once in a while and let him know that you were wrong. Yeah, give us a call, Jordan. We'd love yeah. to, uh, we'd love to gloat about him accidentally walking backwards into a correct <laughs> pick. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. I think my favorite part actually is that on Friday, as everybody's getting excited for this huge weekend of football and, you know, predicting all these, all these crazy, you know, people were saying that other than the, other than the Tennessee New England game, that this was going to be a couple matchups that were probably going to be better than expected and a lot harder to pick. And you were out on your limb out there with this isn't even going to be a good weekend of football. The Eagles aren't going to be able to compete. Steelers are going to win, or, you know, you said the Steelers are going to win and then you backed your way into the Jaguars pick. Um, and then we both were wrong about the Saints, although that really could have gone either way. I mean, at the end of the day, I think the surprising thing to me was how close the games were. Uh, the Jags Steelers gave us a great game. Obviously, you just mentioned the Saints. I mean, anybody that wants to come at me, I always say to this, like, you tell me, all of you out there that had your a year's salary, would you bet on Case Keenum making the winning throw or Drew Brees? I, I mean, I, I, we weren't using any fantastic logic there. I mean, you look at that play at the end, and I keep looking at it, keep trying to figure out how that happened. I mean, it's great for Minnesota, uh, fantastic for Case Keenum, but I just I still can't figure it out. Well, I mean, I think the the thing is that the what we're seeing is a bunch of newer teams that are not the playoff perennial favorites, and it's really hard to disengage from a narrative that you're used to. Even understanding that some of the teams that we're used to seeing, like the Seahawks, didn't make it. Even understanding that there will be a replacement of of the old guard at some point and some of these guys are aging it's still difficult like you said to look at a matchup of a Drew Brees and Case Keenum and and decide that we think that this guy who wasn't even supposed to be the starter this year is going to lead his team but the Vikings are such a well-rounded team and our tendency to look at just the quarterback um, and not just us a lot of people in football um, can kind of blind you to everything else going on. Well, and how much of this all comes back to the quarterback, quarterback conversation? Because realistically, what we, you know, I've made fun of all year, the defense wins championships, because I'm not sure that's necessarily true in the NFL anymore. And then what do we see over the weekend? The better defense in these games managed to come out and, and somehow even a 45-42 game that was a mm-hmm. bit of an aberration, that was still the, the Jags defense made that win happen, it, it, which is, sort of alarming. You look at each of these across the board, and I think I fell so in love with the narrative and conversation about quarterback that it's easy just to forget that there is an entire other side of the field. Absolutely. Well, and we were talking a lot about experience on Friday, and the stat that stood out to us was how lopsided these quarterback playoff starts were heading in. The only quarterback who had more playoff starts by a significant amount who came out on top was Tom Brady. Um, ben Roethlisberger's 20 playoff starts to Blake Bortles, one, didn't matter. Matt Ryan's nine to Nick Foles, one, didn't matter. Drew Brees, 12 to Case Keenum's none, didn't matter. And I was kind of joking because Adam Schefter tweeted out the final four quarterbacks, and you're looking Foles, Keenum, Bortles, Brady, and I jokingly said it's a quarterback's league, folks, and people thought I was serious. And my point <laughs> was, yeah, it is a huge deal, but some of the best quarterbacks in the NFL were sitting at home for the postseason, Russell Wilson, Aaron Rodgers, because you got to surround them with enough talent. And you're right about the, the, the defense – and the other parts of the team being overlooked far too often, and we're seeing now the results of that. I think the biggest example where I just had my head up my rear end had to be uh, <laughs> the, the Eagles. I mean, the Eagles as a team, uh, did they did they look good, good as an offense? No, not particularly, but uh, as a team, they look just so impressive. And I sat there the whole time thinking, every time the Falcons got the ball, I was like, well, this is the drive where it's just going to, you know, they're going to pick up, they're going to get a little momentum, and it's going to be fine. And then I kept watching it thinking, nope. 
Nope. It, it was amazing to watch the Eagles, who I felt like each of these games had their own momentum swings, but there were clear-cut teams that were playing harder, faster, and, and to that degree better, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And uh, I look at that game, the Eagles did that. I look at the Jags, they did that. And the Patriots obviously did that. And frankly, Minnesota looked like they were taking it to New Orleans. A lot. Like The more aggressive team felt like it won each of those games. Well, it was an amazing weekend of football, despite your dire prediction. Yes. And we have tons more to get to, uh, but it's time for Sports Center. Breaking news this morning, Tennessee Titans and head coach Mike Malarkey have mutually agreed to part ways. This comes after the Titans got blown out by New England on Saturday, 35-14 in the divisional round. We'll have more on that coming up in about five minutes. Vikings shocked the football world with a walk-off touchdown pass from Case Keenum to Stefan Diggs to beat the Saints. 29-24, they advanced to the NFC Championship game where they will travel to Philadelphia to face the Eagles. Blake Bortles led the Jags, of course, to a 45-42 win over the Steelers at Heinz Field. They'll travel to New England next weekend to take on the Patriots in the AFC Championship game. And finally, a British butcher who got locked in a freezer says he was saved by a frozen sausage that he used as a battering ram. (laughs) Chris McCabe says he became trapped in the walk-in freezer last month when wind blew the door shut. McCabe said he tried unsuccessfully to kick the button free before picking up a 3.3 pound black pudding, a form of blood sausage. The grateful butcher told the Daily Mirror, black pudding saved my life without a doubt. For all the latest headlines and information, tune into Sports Center on ESPN Radio all throughout the day. Coming up next, we mentioned that breaking news. Malarkey out in Tennessee. We'll react to that, plus more on an incredible weekend in the NFL. That's straight ahead. I'm Sarah Spain. He's Jason Fitz. This is the Dan Levitard Show with Stugatz on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Winning at sports and at sports broadcasting means changing things up. Just like La Quinta Inns and Suites is changing up their look. A renovated lobby that's so contemporary it even makes Goal look look cool. Yes, it does. And a totally updated fitness center that even has Wingo feeling like a workout. I'm ripped. Plus, plenty of comfortable spaces to hang out. Yeah, this La Quinta look definitely has a vibe of victory. So you can just relax, refresh, and get ready for your next big meeting. Prepare to win at business with La Quinta Inns and Suites. Book now at LQ.com. The guys are out today for the holidays, so Sarah Spain and Jason Fitz with you. You can regularly hear us weeknights, 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern, Spain and Fitz. Big weekend of football and... Fitz, we were wrong on a couple things. We got a couple things right, but uh, to me, I think the 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 continuing saga and tale of Blake Bortles giving the figurative middle finger to everybody else in the league continues to be incredibly entertaining. And we'll get to that and him talking back to some of his haters. You'll see whether he took the high road or the significantly lower road in a minute. Um, but the breaking news uh, today is that the Titans are saying goodbye to head coach Mike Malarkey. And you are a Nashville guy. This was your team. Uh, you picked against him, as did I, in the opening round. We both were surprised that they advanced. And then the inevitable uh, meeting of the buzzsaw that is the Patriots ended their season. Usually when a coach is in the divisional round of the playoffs, that's a pretty good sign that they're going to be safe. Not the case for Malarkey. Fitz, what do you make of this decision by the Titans? And to that point, Sarah, first time since 2008 they've made the playoffs. So it's a franchise trending in the right direction. This The decision doesn't really surprise me. Uh, Amy Adams-Strunk, who's the uh, majority owner for the Titans, came out in the statement that they made, said we did, in fact, uh, discuss extending his future with our team over the past week. But in those discussions about the direction of the team, it became evident that we saw different paths to achieve greater success. So the quick translation for me, after spending a year and a half covering the team in Nashville, uh, is that this came down to offense because uh, Malarkey is a very loyal person that has a very set way he wants to run his offense. Terry Rubisky is the offensive coordinator. At the end of the day, Marcus Mariota has not continued to develop, and there's been just this rising swell of they've got to get somebody in that can be a quarterback whisperer if they're going to make the most out of Mariota. So uh, I think this is it's going to be an interesting moment and an interesting uh, hire for the franchise because they've got a quarterback that they've got to figure out if he's worth mega, mega, mega bucks. He's going to come up for that contract soon. So uh, just keep an eye out. Everybody knows John Robinson's the GM for the Titans. Uh, he came from the Patriots tree, so people around Nashville for a long time have thought that John Robinson has his eye on Josh McDaniels. So uh, you could uh, you could see another uh, team in the Josh McDaniels hunt. Uh, you, you mentioned Mariota. 
his worst NFL regular season in year three when a lot of people expected him to take that next big step. Career low, 13 touchdowns, career high, 15 interceptions. Um, but we did see a really nice effort from him in that opening playoff game, not only passing touchdowns to himself, which uh, was remarkable, but using his legs, making good on plays that fell apart, um, and making some crazy good blocks, you know, p- plays off the ball that helped his team. I think that probably ingratiates him to his teammates. Um, the question is, how can you get that consistency in a regular season? Uh, and if you don't think that Malarkey uh, was the guy getting that out of them, out of him, was there an opportunity to keep him as head coach and then bring in a quarterback's coach or offensive coordinator who would be better suited? Because a lot of times I think people equate the idea of having a head coach who's offensively minded um, with being a quarterback savior when it doesn't need to be the head coach in that position. It could be that somebody else on the staff is the one tasked with making that work. Well, and and I think when the Titans in their statements say it became evident we saw different paths to achieve greater success – that's to me says we told him to get a new offensive staff and, right. uh, and Mike, Mike, that just isn't the way Mike works. It also, you know, when we talked earlier about our, our terrible predictions, uh, one thing we did get right on the Titans game. Uh, I said it going in is that fact is Malarkey was going to have Malarkey. Mariota was going to have to use his feet to get a win, which also meant he was going to have to stay healthy. They reported after the game, he strained his hamstring in the first quarter mm-hmm. and they had to change their offense because of it, which is why this thing got out of hand quickly. Uh, the, the only shot they had was using Mariota's leg. So it'll be interesting to see because he does have the label, air quotes, of injury prone. So whoever comes in, are they going to still let him use his feet or are they going to try and get him in the pocket so he's not hurt every year? Absolutely. The Titans were 3-13 and in 2015, 9-7 and in 2016. Uh, nine and seven this year, which, you know, even though they managed to beat the Chiefs in the wild card round was a disappointment. Um, the fact that they had back to back winning seasons after, after really struggling, I think bodes well for Malarkey if he goes out and looks for another job. Um, but Mar- Mariota's decline doesn't help him. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And this is now the second time, uh, Malarkey's been fired because he was the coach in, in Buffalo and just didn't get it done there too. So, you have to wonder what the future looks like. Uh, more importantly, uh, with all of the hiring coming in right now, we've, we've heard all the rumors, Matt Patricia possibly, the Lions and, uh, you know, Josh McDaniels to every team. It'll be interesting to see how quickly they can comply with whatever they need to comply on Rooney Rule. And then they can also get to uh, the, the chance to talk to coaches they want to talk to because if it's a Patriots coach they want to talk to, they have to wait till that season's done. Mm-hmm. Which is a risk because then, you know, you can lose out on other opportunities, other coaches that are out there. Um, it, with the Patriots, usually you would be looking at a team preparing for a big postseason game and say, how are they going to deal with the talk about Matt Patricia going to the Lions and Josh McDaniels going to the Titans and the story from Seth Wickersham and everything else. And instead, it's more like, eh, they'll be fine. Like, we don't even worry about the Patriots when it comes to stuff like that. And this year, it's interesting because in that Seth Wickersham story, he talked about how Belichick, for the first time, really seems to be invested in growing the coaches below him and working with them on finding them another job and being okay with that instead of resisting it. It's going to be interesting to see how that changes their success next, right? I mean, it's it's kind of crazy. We just presume that the, the Patriots are going to win no matter what, but they do have two coaches that are out there interviewing for jobs, figuring out what they would build in a staff. I mean, it's a really complicated thing. It's almost like Alabama in, in the college ranks and New England in the professional ranks can just handle whatever's thrown at them. Everybody else, it's an excuse for why they lose. Mm-hmm. I'm Sarah Spain. He's Jason Fitz. This is the Dan Levitard Show with Stu Gatz on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive's Home Insurance. Get your quote at Progressive.com today. Coming up next, the first ever Jacksonville Jaguar, former All-Pro Tony Baselli, friend of the show, will join us to talk about the Jags' run to the AFC Championship game. That's straight ahead. Sarah Spain and Jason Fitz, the Dan Levitard Show with Stu Gatz on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. Hi, everyone. Stu Gatz here. Support for the Dan Levitard Show podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, and your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. With Rocket Mortgage, you can apply simply and understand fully so you can mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash Stu Gatz, S-T-U-G-O-T-Z, Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. 
joining us on the Shell Penzo Performance Line, former All-Pro Jaguars lineman, current radio analyst for the team, Tony Baselli. Don't have to deal with Dan and Stugatz today, so that's a, that's a good way to start your Monday, Tony. So why do you think I said yes so quickly? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so the first ever draft pick for the Jaguars gets to watch them get a surprising win behind the arm of one Blake Bortles, who your buddy Chris Sims said was the 70th best quarterback in the NFL. I just want to see if you have any thoughts for Chris Sims this morning. I know you said the most impressive thing he's ever done is almost die on the field. Do you have a follow-up? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, uh, you know, I, I will wait for my overall comments to the next time I get to have uh, an opportunity to talk directly to Chris Sims on the radio. But <laughs> I, I think it's, I think big picture, it's ridiculous, not only, you know, with, some of the things Chris has said, but the overall commentary about Blake Bortles. I'm not saying he's great. I'm not saying he's, you know, Tom Brady by any means. But if you go look at the numbers this year, he's not terrible. I mean, he's not like he's awful. There's a lot of quarterbacks that start in this league that are much worse. And the bottom line is he's on a team that scored 45 points in the playoffs to take them to the AFC Championship. And he was a major part of that. So Blake is. You know, it was he was it was so bad for him last year, and it was so ugly at times that I think the perception is is that there's just no hope for Blake Bortles, and that's just not the case. So, Tony, even after the win, part of the conversation seems to be, well, the Steelers were looking past the Jags. Uh, are we just all losing sight of the fact that maybe the Jags are just that stinking good? They're a good football team. I mean, by the way, the Steelers should really shut up, uh, and anyone who talks <laughs> about the Jaguar Steelers matchup should like, okay, I don't care what happened as far as looking ahead and all this nonsense. They beat them 30-9 to and 45-42. Twice this year they beat them. They scored 75 points on them. They, the Steelers got beat. I mean, there's no – I don't – there's the stop trying to justify why the Jaguars are in the AFC Championship. They're one of the best teams in the NFL, and now they got an opportunity to go to the Super Bowl. Yeah, you know, you mentioned Bortles not being great, but also not getting enough credit. Fitz and I, over the last couple of weeks, have sort of been trying to pinpoint what exactly it is about Bortles that makes other teams, players, broadcasters, pundits, so free and willing to to crush him. I mean, there's been worse quarterbacks in the league. There's been more hateable quarterbacks in the league. What is it about Bortles that makes everybody want to jump on this bandwagon where they feel good publicly trashing him? I think it's a couple things, you know. And by the way, I'm fine with the media that doing that's. Just, I guess, and I, I'm partly in the media nowadays. Is that that's the job? I mean, people say things, and people are trying to get clicks and mentions and all this other stuff. Whatever. I'm, I'm fine. Actually, the media makes me laugh half the time. But it's shocking to me that peers of his have the freedom, or feel like they have the freedom to just take shots at a guy that number one just beat them. And number two is one of the guys that's in the league with him. I never saw that before when I played. I mean, I don't think that – I think that's fairly new, um, of taking the unwarranted shots that they have. And I think part of it is due media-wise, Jacksonville is an easy target. It has been for a long time. It's an easy target to take shots at. The fan base has been ridiculed. The organization has been ridiculed for years. And now some of it rightfully so in the sense of this team hasn't won in a long time. And then Blake Bortles on top is kind of just part of that – you know, he had a bad year. And the other thing with Blake is, I mean, last year he had a bad year. He actually played pretty well this year. The other thing with Blake is when it, when it's bad, it's really, really ugly. Mm-hmm. Like some of the throws are really ugly and his mechanics get really off. Um, and so that I think sometimes maybe just people see them and they're like, oh, my gosh, I've never seen a guy throw it that bad at times. But and there's some – truth to that because Blake's mechanics at times can get really, really awful and some throws we even in the booth say, oh my gosh, where'd that come from? But the flip side of it is there, when he plays, what when he, he is a competitor and if anyone was ever around him and you were a team of him, you'd love him because he's one of the toughest guys, never blames anybody, takes it all on himself and, and finds ways to win games with his legs and he'll make big throws when you need him to at times. Uh, and so, but it's a uh, it's a little much, especially especially the, his peers taking shots like they have, in my opinion. We're talking to Tony Bazelli joining us on the Shell Penzo performance line. Tony, if Blake uh, goes out and wins it, if they get themselves to a Super Bowl in this process, what's it mean for the long term contract status for him with the Jags? It's a great question because, and I so I love Blake. I'm glad he's on our team. I still would if I was in charge. 
I would just say, listen, you're going to play out your fifth year rookie deal. Now he's going to make nineteen million dollars. I don't think anyone's going to feel sorry for him. But regardless, we, you know, you could win the Super Bowl and he could be MVP. I'm not signing him to a long term deal. Because I want to see him do it multiple. I'm, I'm taking all the emotion out of it, which unfortunately GMs don't do. That's why Belichick, by the way, is the best. He takes all emotion out of every decision he makes. And if you take the emotion out of it, I would say, Blake, we'll pay you $19 million next year, but you have to do it again before we give you a long-term deal. So, Tony, Blake Bortles, as we mentioned, wasn't blowing anyone away with his stats, but they did enough offensively to make up for what was actually a poor performance from their D. Ben Roethlisberger threw for yep. 469 yards, a franchise record five touchdowns, um, and he was intercepted and he had a fumble return for a score. So the defense did their part at times. But when you look ahead to the next game, they're going to need a much better performance from the defense to make up for the fact that Bortles isn't a Ben Roethlisberger or a Tom Brady. What do you expect from well- the next game? Yeah, I think, I mean, Sarah, the, the, the defense is what's carried this team. And so last, I mean, yesterday they were not very good. Now, some of the plays that Antonio Brown made and, and the right. throws, Ben, you know, at some point, I tell people all the time, you have to tip the, your cap to the other guy. You have possibly three Hall of Famers, and Le'Veon Bell, Ben Roethlisberger, and Antonio Brown playing all together. And very good. They have three pro bowlers on the offensive line. And so it's not like that's a bad group. Um, but I think coming into New England, you know, I think it's going to be a scrappy game. I think the defense will play much better. Every I, In the uh, NFL, every game's different. I mean, last week, literally, the Jaguars scored 10 points against the Buffalo Bills. I mean, and barely got 10. And all of a sudden, they scored 45 against Pittsburgh. And so who knows what's going to happen this coming uh, weekend. But bottom line is, defense is going to have to really, really clean it up a little bit and make some plays because it's a, it's a very good, you know, they got Hall of Fame players in you know, and Brady and Gronk, and and they, they're going to have to figure out a way to turn them over. And they did it against Pittsburgh. they got to get a couple turnovers, create some short fields for the offense. And if they're going to win, it's going to be a three-point, you know, it's going to be a tight game. And that's just how it is. But the defense is so uh, talented, I, they can go up there and win. I mean, they're not the favorite by any means, and as much as I love them. Uh, it's, you you got to create some scenarios in your, you know, to figure out how they win the football game. But they're talented enough, and that defense flies around, and who knows what will happen. Pick off Brady, pick off Bumble like they did against Pittsburgh, and next thing you know, you're in the Super Bowl. Tony, have you guys gotten any indication on Leonard Fournette and his health of where he stands going into next week? You know, he's been beat up the whole year. I mean, he really has the last 10 weeks. He's not been healthy. Uh, the ankle has bothered him. He's a quad. He came back and made, you know, had some nice runs. I don't think he had the same explosion explosiveness he did to start the game. But he'll be fine. You know, it's AFC Championship game. You know, figure out a way. Take whatever medicine you have to. And that's my, I mean, I'm not saying that's what he's going to do, but that's what I would do. You know, where's the where's the magic, you know, medicine that makes everything go away for <laughs> four hours? Because that's what I'm going to take. It's my goodness. How you get, trust me, if somebody played and got hurt, you never know when it's over. And you and I've played in the AFC Championship game, you don't know if you're ever going to get a chance. So you better go do whatever you have to do to play that football game. The magic medicine. That's a good way of, uh, that's a good way of putting it. We'll stick with that terminology. Thanks so much for some of your time, Tony. Really appreciate it. Enjoy the game this weekend. All right, guys. Enjoy the, uh, Levitard show today. <laughs> Keep the seats warm. <laughs> we will. Thanks, Tony. The guys are off today. Sarah Spain and Jason Fitz in with you on this Monday morning. You can regularly hear us 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern on ESPN radio. Weeknights, Spain and Fitz. It's time for Sports Center on ESPN Radio. Breaking news this morning as the Tennessee Titans and head coach Mike Malarkey have mutually agreed to part ways. This comes after the Titans got blown out by New England on Saturday 35-14 in the divisional round. Vikings shocked the football world with walk-off touchdown pass from Case Keenum to Stephon Diggs. They beat the Saints 29-24 and move on to the NFC Championship game. They'll face Philly in Philly. Blake Bortles led the Jags to a 45-42 win over the Steelers at Heinz Field. They'll travel to New England next weekend to take on the Patriots in the AFC Championship game. And finally, a storm blew historic and historic building to Canada, and Maine wants it back. A fishing industry building on the U.S. National Register of Historic Places is half submerged in waters near a Canadian island, and conservationists fear it could disintegrate before legal tangles are resolved including salvage rights claims by some Canadian citizens that could doom the building. The bureaucratic nonsense is hampering us big time, said Lubeck Landmarks President Rachel Rubior. 
for all the latest headlines and information, tune into Sports Center on ESPN Radio all throughout the day. Spain and Fitz with you, filling in for the guys. And there's been a lot of talk lately, Fitz, particularly. We're not, we're not even going to address the building. Like, there's just finders no, no, keepers no. rules on a building. Nothing. Yeah, we the got, building okay. is half okay. submerged. It's now Canadian property. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. You're going to have to pay some serious taxes up north if you want, oh. if you want to stay there. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Um, the, this weekend on Saturday Night Live, uh, weekend update featured one of our favorite characters, uh, Keenan Thompson as LeVar Ball. And there's been a lot of talk lately about how ESPN is the only thing continuing the charade, 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 that is LeVar Ball, right? And I understand that, yes, ESPN is a massive part of this guy having a spotlight, his words being spread around. That's because people are interested. People are clicking on the stories. People want to hear about this guy in the same way that people complain about all the Tebow talk, and then they immediately clicked on the story if Tebow was involved. Uh, but Fitz, we're not alone. There are other people that are that are lifting up and spreading the gospel of LeVar Ball. It's not just us. <laughs> I like that you went with the gospel of it because now it's oh, going to yeah. become its whole church. Yeah, no, that's going to be his first book, the gospel of Lavar Ball. Fantastic, and and it grows even when the boys don't play well, right? I mean, we should know the boys no points uh, in in their Lithuanian uh, debut, pro, debut. Uh, pro yeah. debut. So zero points, uh, it, it, really ineffective basketball in Lithuania. So not getting any better, but but yes, everybody's paying attention to it absolutely across the board, not just us, but even uh, entertainment uh, places like I don't know Saturday Night Live. Yeah, we can't I told play. my kids the F stands for phenomenal. <laughs> the best part about that is it was followed up with a yes, they're homeschooled. Um yeah, this uh this guy, uh uh Keenan Thompson, we can't play the whole clip, but uh, a couple things in there stood out to me. Another one was his claim. I'm the only man in history to out pizza the hut. <laughs> Um, there's a reason why a show that's not even a sports show is featuring LeVar Ball. And that's because he appeals to exactly what we like these days. Absurd, over-the-top insanity in the form of uh, someone with charisma and swagger. And whether you dislike him or not, you have to admit that he draws the cameras in. His response to his sons going 0 for 7 from the field in their pro debut to Liet Cabellus Panavizizis, which I'm sure I just nailed, um, nailed it. was to say that they just needed to play them more together. That that was the problem. That if you have two guys that cannot make a shot, the thing that will fix it is to put them on the court together. So, uh, you know, I, I'll admit I'm an old guy, right? But when I was a kid, Voltron was a big deal, you know? And oh, so yeah. Voltron had the little robots, and then together they were one massive robot. So they all were sort of like butt-kicking robots, but then you stack them all together into one massive butt-kicking robot. What is it if all your robots stink? Like, if you've just got <laughs> to, like, you, you're making them into Voltron, but it's not going to be a very impressive. I mean, it's only going to get worse the bigger it gets. Put them together, it's only going to stink more. Keep in mind that one of these kids is 16 years old, playing in a Lithuanian pro league, uh, which, by the way, I'm only saying Lithuania now because of our our girl with the with the uh, rap record, who yes. I really I, I think she's teaching us all about Lithuanian culture, and I believe it is now supposed to be said Lithuania. Um, he's 16 <laughs> years old. He just got pulled out of high school, and now he lives in the middle of nowhere in Lithuania. He's playing against grown men. Um, he only got five minutes of time, 0 for 4. Leangelo played nine minutes. He was 0 for 3. Um, so, of course, LeVar's response is that they just need to play more, that that's the, that's the missing puzzle here. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of conversations about LeVar and the criticism that ESPN has gotten for continuing to spread, you know, his statements, giving him a spotlight. Um, to me, as long as his son plays for the Lakers, as long as Jeannie Buss is posting photos out to dinner with Luke Walton saying, we believe in Luke Walton, then this is a story. Well, and that's a, that's a huge deal because Jeannie and Magic both tweeted out support for Luke. And you're looking at it saying, look, we, we can have the argument all day long about what kind of platform the Ball family deserves at this point as a general whole. But you cannot deny the fact that when you've got your the people that run your organization tweeting active support for a coach, it tells you that the conversation has gotten out there. It's just become 
a piece of what you have to deal with for the Lakers. And, and it's going to be interesting moving forward because not only is it a piece for, for the Lakers, uh, for the rest of the family, should any of them ever uh, come into the NBA, every team's going to have to sit there and say, okay, we've seen what happens over here. Do we want to deal with that again? It's an interesting situation because it's not going anywhere. The ball family thing is only going to get bigger and louder over the next couple of years as the boys get older. So, it, Well, assuming that they're any good, right? right? And that's going to be the difference, I think, is that – if LeVar Ball continues to talk, people don't want to listen if Lonzo's window or the expectations for him kind of close, right? If he isn't the, the sh- you know, shining young star that they expect to build around in L.A., if it becomes clear that he's not going to be a great pro, people will stop caring as much about him. And as for the younger boys, there's no guarantees, right? Especially now that they've been pulled out of the system that most people use to get to the NBA, um, I just think it's funny that when Lonzo was about to head to the Lakers, LeVar said, okay, I'm not going to do any talking about the Lakers because, you know, I'm not going to be hanging out in L.A. You could take it from here. He made it to where I wanted him to get to. Now I'm going to shut up. Did anyone believe that? Uh, they shouldn't have. I mean, not if you got a brain. I mean, and at this point it just continues to snowball. Yeah, I mean, and they didn't do any favors for themselves by by introducing Lonzo as if he was the second coming of Magic Johnson or, or you know, one of the Hall of Famers from that team. And if they don't, if the Lakers don't decide to put a stop to it soon, I think uh, it's only going to get worse for them. They need to wrap it up and take some control over the situation. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Coming up next, what did Mike Malarkey's ouster in Tennessee mean for Marcus Mariota? Plus, will Case Keenum and Blake Bortles still be playing? for the same teams next season. Let's not forget Sam Bradford and Teddy Bridgewater are out there. Spain and Fitz on Levitard. Hello, I'd like to deposit this to checking. Fate is a fickle master. What? The future is uncertain. Okay, and what's my account balance? Ah, the horizon is cloudy. I see a long, treacherous voyage Um, filled with great peril. Look, can I just get a deposit slip or something? A fortune bank teller. Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to GEICO. I see a yellow-eyed serpent and a low APR. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more.